Hi everyone, I'm JM, this is the Lotus Diaries. Today I've decided to do something that I haven't done in quite a long time, which is just go for a drive. There's a few reasons I want to do this. Uh, the first among which is that I've got my running in service coming up and I thought there was a piston heads meeting on today, but that got moved, so I need to put some miles on the car. The car's at about 750 currently. Ideally I want that as close to 1000 as I can get for the service to happen. Secondly, I'm testing a new camera mount, which is this one, and I've got a couple of onboard cameras running as well to give you another couple of angles and also for me to cut to when I make terrible mistakes. I want to really start with saying thank you to everyone that's been watching the video so far, particularly to those of you who have subscribed. If you haven't, please do. I appreciate every single like, uh, subscription and view that I get. It means an awful lot to me. I put a lot of work into doing these videos and I'm really really grateful for the appreciation and the warmth with which they've been received and the car as well but yeah it's a cool car so you can't help but like it really. Today I thought I would perhaps articulate better than I did in my first video my reasons for choosing the Evora and ultimately the 400. Probably the best thing to do first is to give you a little bit of context about my car history so, so, my first ever car was a Peugeot 1.6 diesel estate, a 407, but we'll uh, not really talk about that. The first proper car that I owned was a BMW 330ci Club Sport E46. I loved that car, it was Estoril Blue. It was a very, very faithful companion for about two years and about 50,000 miles. I took it pretty much everywhere. It went from Wales to Scotland to Denmark to Germany to Austria to France to Spain, all over the shop, and it pretty much never let me down. That was something of a beginning of a love affair with German cars, BMWs in particular. Shortly after that, I had a a half share really in a, a 911. Uh, it was a bright yellow 996C4 with a GT3 body kit. It was in lovely condition and I really really liked it. At the same time I was also helping to sort of do a rolling restoration on a 993 Targa. So for about six months I was in the very fortunate position of having both the 993 and the 996 on the driveway at various points in time and it gave me a, a real good opportunity to compare and contrast what are fairly uh, important models in Porsche's history. Uh, so my next car was a BMW 645i, the E63 model. Very, very big, very, very comfortable, very, very wafty. I uh, had a nice V8 engine, which to be honest was my primary motivation behind getting it. I wanted to have a V8. Uh, it said, I suppose, mostly by Top Gear, that you've got to own a V8 and you've got to own an Alfa Romeo. I owned an Alfa Romeo once for about 48 hours and really I don't want to talk about it. It was a horrible experience from start to thankfully not too long after finish. I had the 645 for about 15,000 miles, which I did in less than a year, and it was faultless. I had to replace a bulb in it, which was already gone when I got it. I had to put a couple of tyres on it, but it didn't need servicing because it has those crazy service intervals that BMW are quite fond of now. It went because in one week I put 300 pounds of fuel in the thing, and at the time it was my only vehicle, so it became a, a little bit torturous to run on occasion, especially when work was then on the ground. So I swapped that for, of all things, a Peugeot 207 diesel, which I still have. I went a few months, probably about six or seven months, without having anything more exciting than the Peugeot. In the end, it started to get to me a bit, so I started saving and saving and saving and saving and saving. So my next car was a Z4M Coupe. Quite an unusual car, but a really great looking car. I think it's the best looking BMW of recent years. For those of you who don't know, it's basically a Z4 with a hard top and the engine from the E46 M3, so that's the 3.2 litre straight six with a manual gearbox. It's a really, really cool car. My stepmother had it and they were looking at changing car because she couldn't really drive it. It's not a great car in town and I wanted something that was fun. It seemed to fit the bill. I wanted to go on holiday in Europe and it being the coupe, had a fairly decent sized boot, so that made some sense. So I got that had that, took it around Europe, really good fun, uh, then needed more money, had to sell it. 
while I still had the Z4M, I wanted to get a track day car because I thought about taking the Z4M on track, but it was worth enough money to me at the time that if somebody scratched it, dented it, or I pranged it, I wouldn't be able to afford to repair it. And it was a very, very good condition, very, very low mileage example. I had less than 30,000 miles on it when I got it. So I didn't want to run the risk. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll get some cheap old snotter of a thing and that will do me on track and I can have some fun and whatnot. So I bought this old E36 325i. Terrible idea. Nothing really wrong with the car, but I, I missed a couple of track days with a combination of being unlucky with the car and uh, having work. And then I just realized I was basically throwing money away and this car sort of sat there for about four months on the driveway reminding me of uh, my idiocy. So that went, and the Z4M went because I needed to pour money into the business again. I went quite a few months and at one point in time I sort of got a bit of money together and I thought I could just about afford a classic Ferrari, something like a 360. At the time you could get a reasonable 360 for about 40, 45,000 pounds and I thought right I can scrape together money, save and I could just about get one because I really fancy the idea of having a Ferrari. I sat there and I looked at the cars, I thought long and hard, I saw a few that I probably would have had but I just about missed them or I couldn't get the money together in time. And I, in the end I decided to do the sensible thing which would be to reinvest the money in my business. As it turned out, the sensible thing to have done probably would have been to have bought the Ferrari because values of those things have skyrocketed. So I sort of regret that a little bit, but you know, these things happen. You know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. So fast forward about a year on the driveway, we've got my Peugeot 207 van, and my other half has a little say at Ibiza. Quite a nice car. Unfortunately, her car was on PCP, which is a sort of finance that basically means we've agreed how many miles she's going to do with it, and at the end of her term, she can either give it back to the company, or she can pay a balloon payment and keep the car. The problem being that the value of the car is dependent on how many miles she was doing it, because so, I decided that I needed something that was fun and sporty and enjoyable for me to drive because I was missing having something with a little bit of power and excitement, but also had four seats in it. So I then looked at the answer to almost everything, which is the E46 M3. I ummed and hard, but I went to see a particular car, and it was a lovely colour, and it appeared to be very, very well looked after, and I bought it. Unfortunately, about 2,000 miles in, or probably less than that, the car started making noises, and it turns out that the head gasket on it had gone. About 1,500 pounds later, the head gasket was back on the car. Unfortunately, after a couple of days, I realised that the car still wasn't running properly, so I ran it back to my mechanic. We compression tested it again and found that cylinder number one, despite the head gasket being replaced, was still down on compression. So we've currently got the car in pieces with the engine having a total rebuild because we suspect the piston ring has gone. Now, those are the cars that I've owned. Alongside that, I've been very fortunate that through friends and through business connections, I've driven a very nice selection of what I'd call reasonably exotic or certainly high-end cars. That includes a couple of classic Ferraris, the 35360, several Aston V8 Vantages, about 30 to 50 different Porsches from 1970s stuff up to sort of 1990s, early 2000s GT and turbo cars, everything in between really, uh, several R8s, uh, V8 and V10 with manual electronic boxes, all sorts of different stuff. So earlier this year I decided that I would do something a little bit unusual and I would spend a fair chunk of money and get what I would class as a seriously nice car. At the time I was looking at about probably 20 to 30,000 pounds, something like that. Now I'd known about the Evora for ages. I'd seen quite a few pictures of it and seen a sort of few clips and things of them, seen the occasional one in the car park and sometimes I saw them and liked them, sometimes I saw them and didn't. I was kind of on the fence about them, but I thought it's a Lotus, Lotus is all about the handling. It's one thing that I always really liked about the 911s is that although they were often down on power with the rivals from stuff like Ferrari and also, you know, BMW, the M3 at the time was often a lot more powerful than the 911. They sort of made up for it with a great handling, a great drive, and just a little bit more drama. So I phoned Lotus, who then told me all about the 400, and I said, well, that's wonderful and lovely, but I don't have £70,000 to drop on a car. 
they said, well, you should try it, you should try it, you should try it, we can do finance for you and all this stuff. And I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what I'd really like to do. I'd like to back-to-back -back drive an S and a 400, because Lotus kept telling me that this 400 is two-thirds new, and they've changed all this different stuff, and it's a sort of completely different car, and yada, yada, yada. And, and I'm one of these people that's fairly cynical, and when they say, oh, it's two-thirds new, I tend to mean that, oh, well, you've changed the colour on that part, so it's a new part now. But I thought, all right, I'll play the game. Uh, find me a dealer that's got both cars. I will go and test drive them back to back. So they sent me to Stratton Motor Company. James Betts there took me out in both the Canyon Red S that I think they still have for sale, and also the white 400 demo car that they have. I really, really loved both cars. I've been driving the M3 for a little bit, and people sort of raved about the handling in that, but I felt that it was a bit yeah, mushy around the dead ahead. It wasn't great. I always sort of felt that with my 911s, that they were telling me exactly how much grip they had, and when I went into a corner, the car told me that I was going to make it through the other side. With the M3, it was more a case of, well, it's an M3, so I'm pretty sure it'll go through this corner quickly. Now, but with the Lotuses, driving both of them, even though it was in pretty crap weather conditions, you could tell that it was a really, really nice thing to drive. And most importantly, I sort of felt that a lot of the things that had got stick in many reviews, particularly the interior, the gear shift, that sort of stuff, was actually really, really good. And I sort of didn't have any problems with it, having driven things like the classic Ferraris, you know, stuff like a 360. Well, I think the interior and the Evora is at least as good as a 360, if not better. Uh, the 400 is certainly miles ahead, yet people are sort of clamoring over themselves to buy a 360 now. So it's just because it's got a prancing horse on the front and not a little green triangle. I then decided that it was probably a 400 that I was going to want. So I started looking at those, working out ways that I could afford it and so on and so forth. And then I thought, right, well, that's a really serious amount of money. I should probably try the other things at that price point, you know, the other things that I could afford, because at that sort of kind of price of £70,000, you have the occasional Ferrari 430 drops into the price, you have the occasional early Gallardo and 405 plane, and a fairly generous selection of R8s in both the V8 and V10 flavour, although not the V10 Plus. So I drove the V8 and V10 R8, I'd already driven a V8 R8 yonks before, and the, to be honest, left me quite cold at the end of the day. It drove like an Audi. It was an extremely competent car, but not brilliant. I drove the V10, and it left me feeling much the same. Uh, I had one particularly comical incident with a dealer who wouldn't actually let me test drive it until I'd already bought it, uh, which to me is not the correct way around to do things. So I didn't even bother going down to them in the end. The V10 R8 in particular sort of annoyed me because it was a car you needed to spend a huge amount of money on to get the thing looking special. I mean, if you sat in one which was a sort of basic spec, it didn't in any way, shape or form feel like the sort of 100,000 pound, 500 horsepower supercar that it was supposed to be. I also ruled out the Gallardo at that stage because it's very based on the R8. It's the same sort of engine, same sort of sound. I know it's supposed to be a very different riding and handling car, but I just sort of felt that it wasn't a special enough car. It was never in love with the looks of the Gallardo. They're a very nice car, uh, for sure, and having a Lamborghini on the driver would be lovely. But I was a bit worried that if it went bang, I definitely wouldn't be able to afford it. The amount of money I was looking at is not the sort of money that I can summon up at any point in time. And as it happens, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a garage that services these sort of Italian exotics, and there's a Gallardo sat there with its engine about six foot away from the rest of the car, and a lot of guys standing around it, scratching their heads, and telling me that it was apparently chucking out blue smoke like there was no tomorrow, and the engine was being packed up and shipped off to Italy to be rebuilt. So that made me feel a little bit good about my decision to avoid one of those. I was told that on the early Gallardos, which would have been the only one I could have afforded, that that was something of a known issue. I also drove an M4. This was one which was tuned up by AC Schnitzer and had something like 20,000 pounds of options dropped on it. I thought that it could be a great car because I'm a real BMW nut, as is obvious. And I drove it and it really disappointed. The chassis was superb. What the Schnitzer guys have done with it is brilliant and it drove really, really nice. But unfortunately, the engine just dominates things and not in a good way. It was a very frustrating engine because 
when you wanted the power, it wasn't there. You sort of put your foot down, and then there's a second while it spools up. And then when you didn't want the power, it was there. Even from about 2,000 RPM, the car has huge reserves of torque, which might sound great on paper, and it's probably really, really good fun if you live somewhere nice and dry with wide roads and you just want to do burnouts all the time. But if you live in England with sort of half cold, damp, wet, undulating roads, having a car that's always trying to escape its own rear tyres is not really the best. I also tried the Jag XK RS. I'm not actually a big fan of the looks of the F-Types, I'm in a minority there, and the old XKRs have all depreciated quite rapidly because the F-Types become so popular. I remember when the XKRS came out and some of them were over £100,000, and these aren't really very old cars, they're only about three to four years old, so given the fact they were now at half the price of when they were new, I thought that they might provide an interesting um, value for money proposition. But I drove one, it had a sort of similar problem to the BMW, it had so much power it just couldn't contain it. Small boy alert. <laughs> I'm as bad as Lorry. I am as bad as Lorry. I took the SKRS out for a test drive. You felt really, really like you were sat in the car. It was like a bathtub, all the windows were kind of up here. Visibility was not very good. You couldn't see the bonnet at all, which was a real shame because it's a beautiful, lovely long bonnet and it was just invisible to you as a driver, which is not very useful when you're trying to maneuver it about. The visibility at the rear was probably not much better than this, if, if maybe not even that good. And again, it just kept wanting to spin up, even at low RPM, and uh, any sort of gear, it would just sort of want to spin the rear tires. Didn't have a limited slip differential, and I just thought, it's going to try and find a hedge sometime. It's a sort of car, if the traction control told you it was broken, you'd pretty much want to park it and just wait till it fixed itself. It was not going to be an exciting car to drive around these kind of roads. Oh, one particularly unusual car that I actually considered, uh, considered fairly seriously, was the new Corvette C7 Stingray. I was lucky enough to get one of those as a hire car for a week last year in California. And on paper, the Corvette actually ticks basically all of my requirements. I like a car with a big, meaty, and more importantly, good sounding engine, and definitely has that. I really, really like target top cars, and there aren't many of those about at all anymore, or at least a car with a sunroof, and the Corvette fills that requirement. I need a car with a big boot, tick again, and I want something that looks pretty crazy, and the Corvette certainly does that. Obviously in America it's a relatively common car, but here it's something of an exotic. In reality, the Corvette would have cost about the same as the Lotus, I did think about it, I went so far as to try and test drive one, but unfortunately the only dealer in the country didn't have one available for test drive at the time. The thing with the Corvette is that I drove it in America, in California specifically, and that's going to be the car's natural hunting ground. Lots of straights, not really many corners, and plenty of just naught to sort of 30 dashes where it sounded fantastic. I didn't really get to try it on any canyon roads or anything, and although I believe it does do very well, the Lotus is pretty much king in terms of handling. And the reality is that I'm going to be driving it on roads that are much more suited to the Lotus than to the Corvette. Plus, a Lotus is a fairly rare and unusual car as it is, but a Corvette is extremely rare and unusual. So if I were in a situation where I needed to sell it, doing so might be unusual. Plus, if I wanted to spec it from new, it's a very expensive car for what is not supposed to be an expensive car, thanks to VAT and all that kind of stuff. And it could take me about five to six months to get it, and frankly, I just didn't want to wait that long. So. In the end, I gave it some serious consideration, but it just never happened. And pretty much the only kind of car that I didn't really give any consideration at all was some sort of Porsche. I know on paper it's the sort of natural rival for the Evora, but I've had a couple of 911s before and driven loads of them, and frankly none of them really floated my boat enough to warrant one. The GT3 and turbo prices had started going crazy, so the only kind of car I could have afforded for what I could get this for would be a 996 GT3 or something like that. And I've driven those, they're very, very nice, but I wouldn't have one over in Evora, certainly not at the same price. I recall when they were only about £35,000 and they were quite difficult to shift at that price, but now everybody knows about them. They're uh, very popular, so that kind of went by the wayside. So that's it for today's video. I want to say an extra special thank you to everyone that's subscribed. I know I don't have many at the moment, but it's more than I thought I might have. And I really appreciate every single person that likes, subscribes, or 
comments on a video. I do read all of the comments. And I try to get back to you where I can. And if there's anything that you'd like to know or like to see in a future video, please tell me and I'll certainly try and get around to it. I would really like to do a Q&A video in the near future. I'm also currently working on improving the technical aspects of the video. I've just ordered a brand new wireless lapel mic, which hopefully should improve some of the sound issues that we've been having. I know a few videos have been a little bit windy, and uh, that should hopefully fix that. We're investing in some more mounts and things, which obviously we've been testing one of those today. I hope you agree that the angle is a little bit improved upon what we can get with a poor little cameraman stuffed in the passenger seat. It's when you're trying to film in a car that you sometimes realise just how small or large they can be. Once again, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye.